Support for Short Stops is presented by the Kalem Trading Institute. Check out our website at www.kaleminstitute.com. On today's episode... It has to be rewarding or else you can... Interview just... us again in a few months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hide the motion. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You know, if you had this Even, interview in January, we'd be happy. You know, hey, man, we're delivering. 20, 20 plus years, we still get emotional. It's a thankless job. <laughs> I don't know why I do it. Call it what you want. A game, an experiment, a gamble. But stock trading in the global financial markets to us is a business. Every day, you're surrounded by the noise. Buy, sell, hold, buy more. And we're going to quiet it down and filter out the best trading strategies, tips, and stock picks. You want information on how to find your next bagger or home run? You'll find it right here on Short Stops. Hi, everyone. We're back. This is episode 11 of Short Stops. We have two senior traders with us today, Mark Pe and Mr. Paki Santos. Hello. guys. Hey. So I think everybody's wondering, I mean, how long have you guys been in the markets? And for us, you guys are like legends in city securities. <laughs> Paki and I both started around 1993 and 94. We started out with FEB stockbrokers. That's the stock brokerage arm of Far East Bank, which is no BPA. longer around <laughs> since they were absorbed by BPA. We moved to city securities around 1995 to improv trading. Um, and oh, you guys were together? In yeah, yeah. We, we, yes. we were uh, hired as a group. The whole FEB yeah. team. Uh, that was right after the merger with BPI. So it was Mark and I um, and about six or seven other guys. Okay. All from Cotabato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then around 1998, we started trading the U.S. market. Did that. Personally, I did it till around 2005, I think. He yeah, did yeah, it for a longer time until about five years ago, six years ago. Yeah, and we did full time client management um, around 2012. Well, I'm new to this, so about two and a half years. Yeah. But you've been in the markets for over 20 plus years, right? How did it start off for both of you? Well, it's a learning curve, you always start off with a loss, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, difficulty. But uh, we were lucky that uh, we ended up joining City Securities because your dad, Edward, um, was really patient with us. He held our hands during the toughest of times. Uh, he gave us a lot of leeway in, in making mistakes and learning from them. And uh, I think that's what kept us in this industry. It's, it's that uh, mentorship that we got from your dad. Yeah, I yeah. actually agree with Paki 100% because uh, not to kiss ass or anything but uh, the only reason both of us are still here is because of um, Mr. D. Also because of Alex. Th- because two people. The thing is when you see how they think and you look around even globally there are very few people who have his vision and his sense of knowing how to filter the good and the bad news and since it's very rare to find someone like that we just try to ride on his shoulders. But what was the learning curve back then? Was it harder? I mean, because markets were much more volatile before well, because you have less inhibition. It's the same, less volume, but the learning curve is because we didn't have any structure. Unlike today, your traders now, they go through a training program. They get to learn from past mistakes of Correct. other traders. To us, it was the sink wild or swim. West. Yeah, sink or swim. The sink or swim. And all of us sank. <laughs> very deeply <laughs> and it, it really took us a while to to recover and that's part of the reason how we started trading bigger volumes because we were forced to do it <laughs> to to overcome our losses i was just wondering how your peers were whoever else joined during those times um you'd be surprised um a lot of them have tried other ventures like um some of them tried opening restaurants <laughs> or um, running their own manufacturing business. But uh, there's really nothing like trading the market. Uh, the returns are better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the headaches are less. I mean, you don't have to worry about... Um, managing people. Managing people. 
which is the biggest headache, <laughs> <laughs> as you know. <laughs> capital expenditure. Capital expenditure and every trying to make payroll every month. So <laughs> some some of them have uh, have been successful in other ventures, but once you've learned how to invest in the market, you don't really leave. Okay. Considering you guys are now handling people's accounts and money now, how has trading or your strategy changed from what you guys were doing before and today? Well, for me, my background was really on scalping and day trading, very short-term oriented. But you can't do that for clients. Their hurdle rate is very different from the, the fees that we used to pay, right? Because we didn't have any commissions for, for a long time. So it was easy for us to day trade. But right now, our strategy has gone from short-term to a more medium-term swing type of trading. Okay. okay. So more deliberate. What, what's the difference in the time frames? If you call short, I mean, just an, at least short, just short, short is from using a five-minute chart to handling a trade for about a week. Maybe. Okay, okay. While now, a couple of months is standard to maybe a year. Okay, so when you, th- when you think about trades now for clients, it's like a yeah. few months to a year now. You have to look at the big picture, okay. look okay. at the long-term trend, and we try to really stay invested in that trend. Okay, yeah. okay. We try to stay away from speculative stocks for our clients. Yeah. Because um, once you get stuck there, it's pretty hard to <laughs> get out also. <laughs> to get out, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, especially if you, know, you handle a certain amount of assets, liquidity and execution risks are magnified. So that, that's, that's one thing we try to, to protect our clients mm-hmm. from. Personally, I try to buy different um, positions for my clients different from my personal account um, mainly because number one I don't want to get emotional about a certain stock which I tend to do when I have it in my personal portfolio <laughs> number two uh, because you want the client to be a priority which means that if you want to sell the stock you have to make sure that you sell your clients positions first before your own so just to avoid any conflict of interest I try to um, choose different positions for the clients and for my for my own. What about position sizing though? Is it much different from how you use your personal account versus clients? Like, do you, are you limiting client positions to like maximum of a certain percentage? Well, by default, uh, all my clients start off with an equal weighting in in their portfolios. So if it's five percent, ten percent, twenty percent, it's 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 all equal weighting, and then if I do get to invest in a stock that works our, in our favor, I just scale it up. So that's the only time there's a sizing difference. But uh, I do the same with my personal portfolio. Um, I start off as equal weighting and if it's working in my favor, I go for the jugular. Like how much do you scale up, if I may ask? The optimal amount is 28%. 28%. 28%. After that, uh, the risk reward starts to diminish wherein you take on more risk from, from volatility. Can I ask where did you get that percentage? The mathematical calculation and the optimal number starts at 20, peaks out at 28, and then 30 onwards, it diminishes. Diminishing returns. Yes. So 30 is a bit steep for clients because let's say you take a 10% loss on a 30% exposure, your overall portfolio gets hit about 3%. You have a string of that then you get into trouble. I, I agree with Paki regarding um, portfolio allocation for clients. It's usually very balanced. But I'm not as scientific as him when it comes to trading my personal account. Um, sometimes I'm 20% of my portfolio is in a certain stock. Sometimes 100% is in it. So all in uh. <laughs> oh, unfortunately <laughs> sometimes it's all in so. but I do I don't do it at one time I do average up just like he does I never average down never never average down you hey guys repeat that they never average down ne- never add to a mistake yeah, there's a saying there losers average losers so <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you talk to clients, I mean, every single client has different expectations, whether it's risk profile, whether it's return objectives. Do you find a way to 
have everybody on equal footing or do you adjust whatever strategy you do based on your investor? Yes, um, the basic client profile is they want to be very conservative, um, but they want to beat the market. Some clients would like to trade speculative stocks. Um, for those uh, quote-unquote special requests, <laughs> we try to accommodate them as much as possible, but we do advise against it. That's correct. I mean, I have a handful of clients who I would have to set aside and I really have to be forthright with them when it comes to explaining the risks of, of, of uh, day trading or scalping the speculatives, the highly speculative ones, especially the ones with, with liquidity issues. Because mm. um, that's what they see. And uh, they're the boss in the end, right? So my, my job is to facilitate. And if they're aware, as long as everything is recorded, I'm good to go. As long as they know what they're getting into also, right? Yeah, that well, is, that's my job. Yeah, uh, that's you know, your job. Yeah. And I'm, I'm supposed to explain these things to them, but I also tell them that... Well, time go up sometimes. No, when, when they tell me that they, they, they still want to play, you know, uh, FES or, or <laughs> similar issues, right? Okay. And this has been a real challenge the last few months, especially yeah. with... PXP now, MRC, and, and, and all we those saw, others. And we, and we saw this coming because at the tail end of every bull market, this is what You happens. always have your speculative stocks go up. And they always have this friend who made 100% in two days. Yeah. And they're the ones who are, well, not 100% in two days. That's not mathematically possible. Maybe in a week when they see a stock limit up for three or four consecutive this day straight and they see they have Ayala land in their account which is making five percent <laughs> in a year. It's yeah. pretty hard to explain. <laughs> yeah so But what we usually do is just wait it out. Because usually that's six back to reality. Yeah. When when uh, stocks go back to equilibrium <laughs> um, these guys who made one hundred, two hundred percent sadly give it all up. Maybe even more. So mm. You know, I've seen this in about 11 times. 11 yeah. talaga. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, again. Pa- Paki is very precise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, from, from, from 1986 to, to uh, today, there have been 11 major corrections or, and four bear markets. But okay. four of those 11 were bear markets. Okay, so, okay. I mean, considering you, you mentioned that, is like what's happening today, the market's down almost 10, 12% from 9,000 plus. Are these drops like normal occurrence to you? You don't get emotional? You just tell your clients? You always these... get emotional. Yeah. You, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean... You can't help it. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I, I take a different approach. Um, I kind of saw this coming. Uh, I, didn't, I just didn't know when. Um, but when it started to unfold, I already had prepared my research. You know, like over the last 10 years, we had five major corrections that averaged around 21% took four and a half months for it to get to the low. You know, if you present these statistics to the clients, and then by the way, out of all these corrections or bear markets, the market eventually makes a new high. Mm-hmm. I mean, as long as your economy is growing, it will return. Maybe three, three years from now, five years from now, we don't know, right? But, but it will uh, recover, that's our assumption. Yes, as long as the earnings and corporates yeah, and the Philippines are doing well. Capitalism works, right? Correct, correct. So, I don't want to overpromise or or sugarcoat the reality. Volatility happens, corrections happen. If your clients are mentally prepared and they're aware of how things unfold, they'll be okay. Hmm. I'm surprised. Actually, been getting additional deposits during this time, and I was telling them I don't know what to do with it. Uh, at, at this point. We're eighty percent cash. Mm-hmm. That, 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 that's, a, that's, that's a also a big challenge. Yeah, that, that's a different problem right now. <laughs> the funny part about that, actually, also, is that when people give you more money, now they think ito na, pwede na, pwede na, nagmamadali na sila during these times. And, and one of the reasons that they give you more money is because they've tried doing it on their own, and usually they probably lost money in the last few months. So, as Sort of a last resort, they just tell you that you are just bahala. So they transfer the money to you. <laughs> well, what, what about you, Mark? I mean, how has it changed? How has this market? I mean, when you're going through volatility, is it 
any different. I mean, you talked about being emotional, but I assume you've seen this so many times also over the last twenty years. It's quite different now because we're handling more um, outside money as opposed to just trading our own account. Because um, the last few times when we saw it coming, we could have just easily cut loss and gotten out of the market. But with clients, if you're holding solid um, growing companies for them, you can't really cut loss because you know that one day the price is going to come back. Plus, if you sell, um, let's say you sell Ayala Land at 46, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to buy it back at a lower price because the bottom of the market might be, you'll you'll see it maybe at 38 or 35, but would you have enough um, foresight to buy at that price? Mm. By the time you have confidence in buying it back, it might be right back to where you sold it. And then it's not going to be a pleasant experience for the client. That's always one of the challenges, right? Yes. Because you always think about if you sell it today, how are you going to buy it back for the client also? Yes. But uh, just to give you an idea of what our situation is now is uh, before the market corrected, we probably raised about uh, 40 to 50 percent in cash. Yeah. So at least that we have some available funds to deploy, um, we're comfortable. Okay. Okay. When you're looking for stocks or you're looking for companies, is there anything specific you're looking forward to? Or at the end of the day, it's all about earnings and... Well, my management style is really... You know, I'm a a systematic trend follower. Um, I do that for my clients. Um, So momentum characteristics have to be present for me. It's not just a fundamental thing uh, and it's enough reason for me to buy um, I did try that before, and I got ulcers. <laughs> so it's it's difficult to be a fundamentalist, um, especially for us, because we, we were trained as as technicians, and we've survived as technicians. Mm-hmm. And so I've explained this to my clients anyway b- before they signed up. Did did choose to to be managed in a particular way. So yeah. It's, it's, it has to be a combination of good value plus momentum characteristics. And then you invest in the trend, stay invested in the trend. So very systematic on, okay. on my end. Okay. So less headaches. Yeah, the, well, the basic things you mentioned, uh, growth and value, earnings, all of that is important. But I'm a firm believer that stocks all have their own personalities, just like people do. Um, just to give you an example, during the worst bear markets, Companies like Meralco, SM, SM Prime, Ayala Cor, Ayala Land, they all went down. But if you're going to look at it historically, they all make new highs. So you can say at that point there were a lot of stocks that were also cheap. But if you follow history, you'll know which ones um, tend to climb back up. And that's not an accident. It's no, number one because the management behind them is pretty good. And secondly, it's the same investors who keep on buying those shares back when they see uh, an opportunity to do so. I, I like that quote. Every stock has their own personality. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we use charts, because you'll see how the stock has behaved over the years. And it illustrates it through, through yes. the price. Given current market conditions, what do you advise your clients today? Patience. Patience. Um, we're in a peculiar position right now uh, prices have gone down they're not expensive but they're not cheap so you have to wait for your the proper uh, setup to enter the market I, I know timing the market is very difficult and uh, you usually miss more than you hit but you will see some signs of capitulation of, of panic and that's the that's usually the best time to enter. Right now, we don't see it yet. Uh, volumes are thinning. Foreign sellers are still present. Personally, I think uh, yeah, Paki is right. Um, we have to watch the foreign activity very closely. For the past few weeks, it's always been net foreign selling. And I think we've all agreed that the sell-off isn't really because of anything fundamentally damaging. It's really just flight from, from the region. And until we, we see some capitulation from all the foreign selling, 
I, I don't think either of us would be comfortable buying this market. All right, fantastic. Um, one last thing. I'm sure there are listeners out there who want to take this approach of handling clients. What would you tell these people starting out? Number one, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a real job. So like every other job, you have to work at it. Um, I don't think any carpenter comes in without any experience knowing that he can build a table. Even a simple table, you'll have, probably have to train a few weeks to be able to build one, a nice one at least. <laughs> and it's the same with managing funds. It, it's not like you can come in off the street and just do it. Um, it's not because you had a good quarter, yeah. you're a genius. You, you probably need to do it a few years with family and friends who won't leave you. And who still love you after yes, you've lost the their the money. After you've lost their money and don't want to disown you. And then when you're comfortable enough, and then you, then you can probably ask some other people to invest with you. Yeah, same, same, same with Mark. Um, definitely, it's not easy. Client management is uh, it's a thankless job. Uh, it's a stressful job. But there are other benefits aside from the obvious monetary rewards it's it's really i think we were better traders because of we we've learned to be more patient uh, to to evolve and work harder because it, it's a whole new ball game when you're working for somebody else and the, the pressure is you know like i said like what mark said it's it's not easy you guys sound unhappy <laughs> <laughs> no no because i mean Look at the situation we're we're in right now. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get the shakes when I get a text. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it's. Uh, it has to be rewarding, or else you can interview just... us again in a few months. Yeah. <laughs> you can't hide the emotion. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You know, if you had Even... this interview in January, we'd be happy. You know, hey man, we're delivering. 20, 20 plus years, we <laughs> still get emotional. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thankless job. <laughs> I don't know why you do it. <laughs> you know no, the, the reason that I think we're better traders than money managers. Eh? Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Where if you were to ask me what my job is, I the first reaction would still be trader. Okay. Yeah. Not okay. portfolio manager. Okay, okay. That was really the the, the, the bonus to it. Because mm-hmm. we have to work harder. Because we, we are responsible for, for other people's uh, money. And you you have to be more aware of your trading. You have to be more organized. Uh, you have to work harder. Um, you said it twice. Have to, yeah. Because <laughs> I have never worked this hard. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, yeah, see, Paki travels all around the country to get yeah. clients. Face them when, when I underperform. <laughs> if Mark and I were just pure traders, like, let's say, five years ago, this type of market, we'd be taking our vacation. We wouldn't have a position. Uh, we'd, we'd monitor the market, but we'd relax. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I can't do that. I haven't taken a vacation in two years. So, yeah. <laughs> no, this, this is my dad. becoming sad. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't worry, Baki. This, no, this is my reality. I mean, <laughs> don't go into it. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's not worth you, it, Caleb students. <laughs> yeah, just, just, just straight. Okay? <laughs> But the benefit of forcing myself to evolve as a trader, that outweighs all the difficulty that I face. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> there you have it, guys. I hope this inspires you guys to be, become better traders, better portfolio managers. And in fact, hopefully one day you guys be able to not just do well for yourself, but do well incredibly for other people. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Paki. Thanks for Thank having you. Us. All right, until next time, see you guys next week. <laughs>